and good morning for our friends out on the West Coast. Uh, I think we'll go ahead and get started. Thanks to all of you for prioritizing this call today, for your work and your leadership every day, and for your interest in learning more about the Innovative Assessment Demonstration Authority, or IADA, and the potential it may hold for your state. I'm Adam Schott. It's my privilege to lead our team in the Office of Elementary and Secondary Education here at the U.S. Department of Education and to support Secretary Cardona's mission to raise the bar for America's schools. A quick note on housekeeping, just to control for any background noises. Uh, lines are muted, but you can add questions as we go via the Q&A icon, and then we're gonna open things up after the formal presentation slides. Earlier this month, Secretary Cardona author, authored a Dear Colleague letter on the IADA. In this letter, the Secretary outlined how additional clarity and additional technical assistance and additional supports might allow more states to consider IADA as a means of strengthening their assessment systems when we're all thinking about every possible way to accelerate student learning. Having come from the state educational agency, I always appreciate how the secretary contributes to these DCLs, the ownership he takes in writing them, and the thought he gives to making sure that words on paper can be translated into action by states. As he finalized this letter, the secretary wanted to be sure that his commitment to supporting states around assessment innovation came across loud and clear. So he asked us to organize this webinar today as a way of amplifying the options that are available to states and to continue a steady drumbeat of actions related to assessment innovation. I know I speak for our whole team in expressing pride that the secretary lends so much of his time and expertise as an instructional leader to our core work here in OESE. And I'm honored to introduce him to provide some framing remarks for today's webinar. Mr. Secretary, over to you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Adam, uh, for that introduction and uh, more importantly, for the leadership that you're showing uh, in the Office of Elementary uh, Secondary Education. Um, and on this issue in particular, uh, like you, uh, Adam, and, and those of you on the call, uh, I came to this role of Secretary of Education straight uh, from being an education commissioner at the height of the pandemic. And I know how hard it, it is uh, to serve as a state chief, especially right now. Uh, it's been always a challenge uh, to lead in education, um, especially now. Uh, but this is also uh, one of the most rewarding uh, careers and one of the most uh, exciting professions to be in uh, as we shape uh, the lives of our students and the potential of our country. There are few jobs in education where you can make a bigger difference for students than as a state chief. And that's never mattered more. We're at a moment of truth in education after a crisis that profoundly disrupted our schools. We've had a historic federal relief that's made a big difference in our academic recovery, but now it's up to us whether we can come out of this moment with truly transformative changes in education that will outlast our tenures in our current positions. That's why we're coming together today to discuss one of the biggest areas where state chiefs can lead and innovate for the better, assessments. And the steps we've taken at the federal level to make that leadership easier for you. Look, you know, I, I, when I was a teacher, all the way moving forward as a school principal and district leadership and at the state level, it's always been a conversation around assessments and how that should evolve to meet the needs of our kids. And I heard from you. You know, in my time as Secretary of Education, if there's one topic in my visits to your states that has been consistent, it's been the ability for us to, to revisit how we're assessing students because we know that assessment is only a part of quality pedagogy, teaching, and learning. We heard you. We know high quality assessments are like a flashlight that shine a light on how students are learning and where the gaps are. At the best, assessments can guide instruction, uh, adjust curriculum, and drive resources to better meet students' needs. When they're done right, a high quality assessment system is indispensable to closing opportunity and achievement gaps and making sure that every student gets a, the opportunity of a rich, rigorous instructional program. And guess what? <laughs> Innovation, isn't always coming from DC. I know that. 
The innovation often comes from the states that are pioneering the best of these assessments. We learn best by learning from one another. We all know too that too often assessments don't meet that mark. Instead of serving as a spotlight, they end up putting a scarlet letter on teachers or on schools. They cut deeply into crucial instructional time, constrain teachers from doing what they know works, putting great pedagogy front and center in their classrooms. I saw it firsthand as a teacher and as a principal during the era of bubble kids. And you know what I'm talking about. Too many generations of students missing out on great learning or feeling lesser than their true potential because teaching was reduced to test prep. Too many teachers working with students that have the greatest needs feeling burnt out and that they have to leave the profession because no matter how hard they work, two or three times as hard having to meet the students where they are, they never made the mark. And we wonder why we have shortage areas in the areas where we need the most support. As Secretary of Education, I'm fighting for you to have higher quality tests. We cannot expect you to innovate in your states to make that possible if we in DC are protecting the status quo. That's why we're stepping up by removing the cap on the number of states participating in the Innovative Assessment Demonstration Authority and providing more running room to states to pilot assessments so that all states have the room to try new ideas. Think about how transformative that can be. Imagine the teachers in your school is able to make the most out of their instructional time because they spend less of it on test prep. And oftentimes the test prep doesn't align with good pedagogy. Instead, they benefit from a high quality assessment embedded in curriculum that helps them target support to their students and give parents a more nuanced picture of how their child is doing. At the end of the day, that might mean more students in your states are achieving in reading and math, and more hopeful about their potential for their future. This is a big deal. So I hope that uh, you as state chiefs with our partnership and support and your teams make the most of this opportunity. If you raise the bar for how you do innovative assessments in your own state, you end up raising the bar for everyone else because you show what's possible. For too long, the misuse of assessments has negatively impacted our ability to have high quality teaching and learning in this country. As leaders, we have the responsibility to do something about it. You know, it, it's easier not to do something about it and, and keep things the way they are, but I've heard from you, I've experienced it myself, let's do something about it together. Now is the time, and you are the change makers. And what, what I want you to hear loud and clear is we got your back in this process. Uh, we know there's no linear path to this, but um, in my opinion, um, we have an opportunity to lead. I can't talk about innovation and transformative education um, it's not just about recovery from the pandemic. We, that's, that's a low bar. We have to do better for our country. And what we heard from you is being innovative in assessments is one way to do that. So we're opening that door and we want you to walk uh, through it and we want to support you in that process. I want to thank you. And, um, you know, to get more details of this process, I'm going to turn it over to someone who's been really leading this work at the Department of Education, someone that is very passionate about this as well. Someone that um, has really brought a lot of uh, great perspective to the Department of Education around this. Uh, someone that I'm fortunate to have as a part of the team, Brenda Calderon from our Office of Elementary and Secondary Education. Let me turn it over to Brenda now, thank you. Secretary for your remarks and for your leadership in this work. We are so excited to have so many states represented here today to discuss the recent updates to our implementation of the IADA. As you know, information on student performance is a critical component to making good decisions in education and where to target resources. It can drive equity, it shines a light on where more is needed, and the goal here is to drive resources, identify early, and intervene so that students don't languish. Through this Dear Colleague letter and our presentation today, we are reaffirming the department's commitment to learning acceleration. Assessment policy is an obvious area of focus given the ESEA requirements, and particularly around the importance of resulting data to guide recovery efforts. Assessments are also an important tool for improving core instruction. When aligned with standards, curriculum, pedagogy, they can drive improvements in teaching and learning. 
And the next part of this presentation, we will cover core tenets of the um, Dear Colleague letter that we uh, recently released. We'll go through the background of the IADA. We'll cover some of the partic uh, states participating. And as I mentioned earlier, some of the updates that we're making are uh, in our implementation of the IADA, including the comparability requirements, we're extending the timelines, we're introducing a planning status, we are emphasizing the importance of family engagement and clarifying the roles of external partners. We'll also sort of hint at a, a couple of funding opportunities for the IADA. And lastly, we'll end for uh, with the call for assessment peer reviewers. So very quickly on the IADA, it's an authority in the ESCA that provides states room to pilot a new assessment without having to double test students. We currently have three states participating in the IADA. Those include Louisiana, Massachusetts, and North Carolina. Here is the statutory requirement. Um, the authority specifically allows states to evaluate a new ass assessment system while maintaining the existing state assessment for the rest of the state without double testing students in those pilot schools. And it also allows for the use of pilot results in state accountability systems in lieu of the statewide assessment. So um, since 2016, we've had five states approved for the IADA, um, and we have three remaining. We've also learned a little bit about implementation from a recent IES report released in April of this year. The link is available on this slide. Um, the report found that IADA pilot projects sought to increase the usefulness of assessment for data for classroom teaching, um, but few were ready to try out their assessments within a year of starting the IADA. And like everything else in our education system, the worldwide pandemic caused major disruptions to um, implementation of the IADA. So the department has been taking a close look at our implementation of the IADA. Um, earlier this year, we released a request for information on ways that we can improve this implementation. We asked questions around comparability. We asked questions around um, the timelines and what flexibility states were seeking around timelines. Um, we asked about general barriers to the IADA, and as a result, we received over 8,000 comments um, to our request for information. We are also engaging stakeholders in the process. We've met with several states. So we've heard from you and what you've thought about what the department can do to um, improve the IADA as well as um, uh, with several other stakeholders. And that led us to the release of the uh, Dear Colleague letter, which is linked here. Um, and, um, and our sort of, uh, our aim to re-energize states that are interested in strengthening their assessments while avoiding double testing of individual students. The Dear Colleague letter emphasizes the department's commitment to getting to yes for states with a coherent plan and a willingness to engage. The department also wants to do as much as we can, as quickly as we can, to capitalize on this momentum. Um, with a clear focus on equity, quality, and the utility of assessments, particularly with a focus on learning acceleration. And now I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Dr. Don Peasley, who is the assessment team lead at the Department of Education, to talk more about these provisions. Don? Thanks, Brenda. So, uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I'm happy to talk about some of the concrete steps um, that we'll be taking in the next uh, six to 12 months to uh, open up the IADA and try to encourage uh, more participation. So the first thing I think you've read, it, if you've read the letter, we, we said it there. Um, and I think Adam highlighted it also. We're simply limiting the number, removing the limit on the number of states who may participate. Uh, in the initial implementation period in statute, there was a limit of seven states, 
but that time is now passed. And so as many states that can uh, apply and be approved may participate in the IADA. In the run up to the uh, request for information and in the vast number of comments that we received in the request for information, the department got a lot of feedback about clarifying um, the requirements for comparability of IADA pilot assessments. And so I'd like to take a, a few moments to do that here. Um, the statute requires that any IADA pilot assessment uh, must have a comparability evaluation that ensures the pilot assessment can express student results or student competency in terms that are consistent with the state's aligned achievement standards and generate results that are valid and reliable and comparable for all st students and for each subgroup of students compared to the statewide assessment. And so what that means practically is any evaluation of an alignment of a pilot assessment with the state assessment must consider both the state's content and the achievement standards. So the department in, eva um, in evaluating state's plans for comparability, we do not expect that the proficiency results are exactly the same between the two assessments because the assessment designs may differ the assessments resulting estimates of performance may differ, but they should bear some, some similarities with each other. And so that's kind of what we're trying to tease out here. So a comparability evaluation can be based upon the evidence of the alignment of both the innovative assessment and the statewide assessment to the state's academic content standards and evidence of the consistency of the achievement classifications across the two systems. So those we think are the two core elements that satisfy that statutory requirement that I was talking about. In the regulations for the IADA, there are four methods, we list five, but there are four specific methods that are listed as possible models that states can utilize. And they are very quickly uh, double testing uh, students in pilot schools with both the full statewide assessment and the full innovative assessment. They could administer or double test the innovative and the statewide test to a representative sample uh, of students in the pilot schools. You could embed uh, items or tasks from the innovative assessment system on the statewide test and, and link the results in that fashion. You can do it the other way. You could embed statewide assessment items on the innovative assessment and, and administer that in pilot schools and link the assessments that way. So those are the four uh, suggested ways that can be utilized. And there's a fifth way, which is an alternative method, which is any other method that a state could use that would provide an equally rigorous and statistically valid comparison. And so through the RFI, we got a lot of comments that uh, people would like the department to define that more clearly, that alternative method. And we're gonna attempt to do that by offering a couple of examples, but mostly we're gonna emphasize the principles that any, any comparability evaluation must demonstrate. So I'll be circling back to those ideas about consistency of the alignment between the two assessments to the content standards and the alignment to the state's achievement standards. So 
but we also want to clarify the department doesn't expect that at the time a state applies for the IADA, that the comparability between the pilot assessment and the current state test has been established. What is expected is that the state has a plan and can describe a plan to evaluate comparability. The department does not expect that the state establish comparability at the individual scale score level, but instead that the comparability be established at the achievement level between each assessment because that's really where the assessment results will be used in terms of the achievement level in the school accountability determinations. So a state has to have a plan that has the potential to demonstrate comparability. And in, in the case of the uh, five states that have received the IADA, in the case of four of those states, they couldn't establish comparability when they applied, but they did outline a plan that the, par the, the department felt had potential to establish comparability. So there's a couple of concrete examples where we can describe what an alternative method of comparability might look like. One is from an IADA pilot, uh, in this case, New Hampshire. And in that pilot, they used what they described as a non-concurrent comparability method. And what they did is they compared the results of students on the grade three reading assessment, the state assessment, with the results one year later of the same students who took the innovative assessment. And then they compared the achievement level match across tests and years. And they focused on the consistency of expectations for the same students, but they did expect there would be some growth from one year to the next. But, but, but all in all, they they thought they'd find some you know consistency in in those expectations, and they they observed positive moderate correlations between the state test and the pilot assessment, and so that's explained in detail on that footnote on this slide. So that, that was in the IADA, that was a method of comparability that was utilized. Now, I wanna kind of step away from the IADA and another uh, method of evaluating comparability, uh, the department thinks we found in our peer review guide from our criteria for states that use locally selected nationally recognized tests in lieu of the statewide test. So that's another flexibility that's in the ESEA. And there are certain requirements in our peer review process that apply to states that use that flexibility. And so what we ask states in those cases to do is to demonstrate comparability between the statewide assessment and the nationally recognized assessment by examining the alignment for both assessments and the consistency of the achievement classifications for both assessments. So those are those two kind of core ideas that I touched on when I started talking about comparability a few slides ago. So we have three states uh, that have been approved to permit that flexibility, um, Mississippi, uh, North Dakota, and Oklahoma. And the, the actual details about the comparability criteria using a method like this are described in the footnote there in our peer review guide. But in short, this type of comparability evaluation, uh, states have to demonstrate that the nationally recognized high school assessment is equivalent to or more rigorous than the statewide assessment with respect to the following the coverage of the academic content, the difficulty of the assessment, the overall quality of the assessment, uh, any other aspects of the assessment that the state may establish in its technical criteria, and that 
the nationally recognized high school assessment can produce valid and reliable data on student academic achievement with respect to all students in each subgroup of students that are comparable to the achievement data for all students in each subgroup on the statewide assessment. So those sound similar to the statutory criteria for the IADA, which was why we thought this was a kind of an analog you could follow if you wanted to apply an alternative method of comparability. So it doesn't really spell out exactly how you would do the comparability, but instead it gives you the targets that you should buy, be trying to achieve through your, uh, your evaluation methodology. And we think that that's really what the intent was behind allowing for an alternative method of comparability in that we, we don't want to define another method. We, we want to leave states open with their partners to, to try to come up with a, a method that satisfies you know, these goals. Okay, so I want to shift from comparability into the idea about transitioning achievement standards. Um, we received feedback through the RFI that some uh, individuals said that what we should simply do is, as a department, is not focus on the statutory requirement that the academic achievement standards have to be comparable. And that isn't really feasible given that we have to faithfully implement what the statute says. But what we would point out is that what a state could do in designing an IADA plan is they could set an initial set of academic achievement standards for their innovative assessment that are, that are comparable to the, to the statewide assessment and use those initial set of standards during the IADA period. And while they're piloting the assessment and working out and de fully developing the system, they could also develop new academic achievement standards on the innovative assessment that, that once they transition the innovative assessment statewide, they could implement. And that would permit the state to have comparable results during the IADA period but then permit new academic achievement standards that perhaps better reflect the new assessment design. So, so that's just a, a thing we wanted to point out. Uh, and we touched on that uh, in the dear colleague letter from a couple of weeks ago. And now at this point, I'm gonna uh, hand the, the rest of our um, concrete steps for IADA implementation over to my colleague, uh, Patrick Rooney, the Director of School Support and Accountability. Thanks, Tom. And thanks everyone for, for joining us. Really excited to have the opportunity to talk to you all today. Um, and thanks for taking the time out to talk to us. Let's see if I can, oops, I went too far. Sorry. Uh, I'm gonna bring us home on the presentation and then we will open it up for some questions uh, I see there's one question in the Q&A function right now, but please, a uh, reminder to, if you have other questions you'd like to raise, now's a great time to, to drop them into the Q&A and we'll, we'll try to get to all of them um, when we finish this presentation. So the next piece that I wanted to spend a minute on is, uh, again, about the application for, for IADA, um, and it is around external engagement, in particularly with parents and also external collaboration um, to really emphasize the importance of engaging with parents and stakeholders as you are developing a new approach to assessment to make sure it's going to meet the needs of um, parents, educators, and the community to get the information that folks need to make good decisions about how to use resources and how to get supports to kids that need it. Um, you know, that is particularly important now as we're kind of transitioning from uh, the last year of ESSER funds being available and thinking about how to decide which investments to continue and how to con continue them, having good actionable data from assessments is one important component to think about when trying to figure out um, how to use your funds when, um, 
we get into the, the period after the ESSER funds are, are no longer available. Uh, so you know, this section definitely really strongly encourages that you are um, having conversations with educators and families about the IADA that you're, you're thinking about as you're designing it and all throughout the process and that you're getting good information to parents about the results of the assessment. Um, the second piece, which is the last vote on this slide, is about external partnerships. And this, this came up uh, in at least one comment in the, the RFI public comments about uh, there's a requirement in the application, which is in the statute, that the state needs to describe external partnerships. And um, we want to emphasize that external partnerships are encouraged, but they're not required. In some cases, states, you go through procurement and um, you, you don't necessarily know who those partners are going to be before you go through that procurement. So you put an application together and you may not know who your external partners will be. All of that is, is well and good and we understand that to be the case. Um, you do still need, it's still in there for you to describe, but to the extent it's applicable is how you would describe it. So if you don't have external partners, if, you don't, if you're not using them or you're not relying on them, then that is, is fine to say in your application. Uh, you know, as the secretary announced in the beginning, there is no cap on how many states can participate. So uh, you are not competing and your external partnerships do not necessarily weigh in on um, the extent we would approve you for IADA. We want everyone to be an IADA who, who has a proposal they wanna put forward. So, um, you know, please just do your best to describe your, your situation accurately. And um, I think all of that is entirely reasonable. So we wanted to make sure we, we clarified that to dispel any um, confusion that might be out there about that part of it. I wanna transition now, get this slide to go, there we go. Uh, the next piece, the next few slides are all about um, timelines or IADA. Uh, and there's a, a second strand of comments we got through the RFI that focused on um, some of the, the questions about when to apply, you know, how to get ready to apply if you wanted to do IADA. And then on the second piece of it is um, the timeline for having IADA authority. And I think in both cases, the secretary's letter tries to lay out that there, there is more flexibility that we're, we're happy to provide uh, to states to really encourage as many as possible who are interested in pursuing IADA to, to do so. So um, I'll walk through those now. The first is a, a new, new announcement for planning status that we are, is now available with the secretary's letter that went out uh, last month that any state who's interested can apply for planning status. And really the goal of planning status, which we designed to be a, a fairly low bar for states that are interested in pursuing planning status um, is, is just to give you kind of an initial boost to your, your idea that you have in place, but you're, you're not necessarily ready to implement something, but you want to pursue it and you want to start engaging with stakeholders and parents and educators about designing an innovative pilot. Um, and we've heard from states that having some sort of you know, okay or a positive encouragement from the department helps with those conversations and also helps um, with your own internal kind of planning to, to know that um, you're, you know, we're not going to beat down an idea that you have. We're actually really open to any ideas you might have. So that, that's certainly not the case. And um, I think this is one way to help support that work at that, that you're doing at the state level. Um, it, it does not replace the actual need to submit a full application before you're ready to implement your IADA proposal in, in schools, um, you would still need to go through that full application process and the peer review process that's laid out in the statute. But this would give you a kickstart to that, um, that approach. Uh, and again, it is entirely optional. It is, it is not required. You can go straight into IADA application if you are ready to do so. Um, but if it's helpful to you, planning status will be available. It is available now. And on the next slide, um, this slide just lays out a little bit of, of what we intend with the planning status. We really don't intend this to be uh, an onerous activity for you at all. Um, it, you don't need to have a full application. You don't need to have a fully baked idea of what you um, expect it to be. You, you should have an idea of, kind of a general approach. 
um, but it could be very, very loose. At this point, we assume that if you're coming for planning status, you're not ready for a full IAD application and um, you may just have kind of the inkling of an idea or maybe even like a, a, a method of how to explore pursuing an IAD application. Uh, all of that would be fine. We definitely encourage you to reach out to us to talk about that if you want. Um, for getting planning status, I, I think a short summary of the approach or design or kind of next steps that you're planning, um, some potential goals that you think of how it's going to help improve assessments, and then a proposed timeline for when you think you would have an IAD application. Again, we wouldn't hold you to that timeline. Um, I, I think it's just for our own understanding, and I think hopefully helpful for you as you're talking to people in the field in your state um, about kind of how you're thinking of the approach as you get into designing an IAD application. Um, I think that is the intent. And then we would uh, try to quickly review that at the department level and send you a response back granting the planning status. And then we would be happy to work with you as we can. You know, we always encourage states to work with their technical advisors and other um, and educators and parents and uh, stakeholders as they're thinking about doing that and get as much feedback as possible. And we're, we're happy to be a partner in that as well. The second piece of the timelines is uh, kind of once you're in IADA and um, you need to think about like how long it's gonna take to be ready to go statewide with this assessment, assuming everything goes well and you want to transition the innovative assessment to being your new statewide assessment at the end of IADA. Um, one of the comments we heard a couple times in the RFI was that five years was not enough time and states needed a longer timeline. So this slide lays out that the statute requires that we give no more than five years. So the, the five-year limit is in the statute. And um, there is in the, the statute an ability for us to create a two additional years after the five years. And then it gives us the uh, ability to grant waivers to give states the time necessary to implement. And um, I think states, the sense we got from some of the comments was that states were looking for more than five years upfront. And because of the statutory limit, we're not able to do that upfront, but um, we are very open. And I think the, the letter tries to clarify that and you know, trying to clarify it now. And, happy to help support you however we can on that. Um, we know states might need more time to, to design something and roll it out and scale it statewide. Uh, and we are committed to giving states the time needed so long as you are continuing to make progress in um, expanding your innovative assessment pilot. And if that takes more than five or seven years, then you know, we're committed to helping support you on that transition. And we'll work with each state to help meet their their timeline to, to scale statewide. And the third piece um, to help support you as you're thinking about whether to pursue IADA or not and thinking about your timeline um, is that we are setting two established timeframes for when we will take applications. Uh, we hope that this helps support your, your planning process to think through you know, the work that you will do to put forward an application and, um, you know, the conversations that you need to happen in the state and the design work that needs to happen within your state uh, in order to help you plan for uh, the eventual IADA approval and implementation. So the first would be, uh, will be the first window will actually be May of 2024. Um, and we're planning it just kind of going forward starting in May and then in December and then the following May the first Friday in May each, each year, and then the first Friday in December each year that we will um, have a deadline for states to submit IAD applications. And um, the goal will be, and I'll talk about this more in the next slide, but if you submit in May, you would get a response back in the summer and you would then implement the following school year. So for May, 2024, that means you'd be implementing in the start of the 24, 25 school year. And then again, in December, if you applied in December of 2024, you'd be applying for the 25-26 school year. So uh, a little bit that which of those timelines you might want to use depends upon um, the time you might want after you get approval 
before you are ready to start rolling this out in schools in your in your state. And the, um, the, the reason for that, and I'm talking through this timeline here, we have a, a deadline of um, 90 days from when we receive an application to when we need to provide a final response to you on whether we're approving your application or not, which obviously our goal will be to approve uh, the states that apply. And uh, that process has been, and the states that have been through this before, you know, might have some good insight into this. Hopefully they have positive things to say about the process. Uh, but we do it once the application comes in, we conduct a peer review. We use that peer review feedback to provide interim feedback to the state and ask them to clarify things that are either unclear or um, could be strengthened in the application and they resubmit and then we provide the response within 90 days. So that, um, that is a fairly tight turnaround between us and you to, to get to that timeline within 90 days. But that means a state can submit in May and they'll have a response back within 90 days, which we think will then give the state a chance to implement in the, that school year that starts in presumably August or September. Um, to help that process, one thing we will do is we will um, each year about 45 or about two months before the, the window to submit, we will ask states to just indicate whether they're intending to apply. That will help us make sure we have our peer reviewers lined up and we are, we are set to um, hit the ground running when a state submits an application so we can meet that, that tight deadline. Uh, so hopefully that timeline will help you in your planning and um, you know, certainly happy to talk to states as you're thinking about submitting an application uh, more than just you know, 45 days before it's due and then when you submit an application, uh, we wanna have open dialogue with states all throughout the process as you're thinking about an application and whatever support we can provide. Again, we, we definitely want to do that. All right, I, I know um, funding is always a, a tough, tough question. IADA does not have any direct funding tied to it, uh, which I know has been a challenge before in the past. And I, I think one of the things we wanted to emphasize is the relationship between the competitor grants for state assessments and IADA. Um, in both of the last two applications for CGSA in 2020 and 2022, uh, we have provided support that, we've provided grants that support either IADA planning or implementation, as well as other grants that support developing um, newer innovative assessment designs. And really the, the purpose of CGSA is very well aligned with the purpose for IADA the CGSA is designed to enhance the quality of assessment instruments and assessment systems used by states to measure academic achievement of elementary and secondary school students. And you know, all of that, that is the same purpose of IADA. It is to improve the assessments for elementary and secondary school children. So the purposes for CGSA uh, are, are very well aligned. They are entirely aligned with the purposes of IADA. And anything you might want to propose in IADA can be funded in CGSA. In fact, uh, on this slide, we, we point out that a lot, of the, a lot of the grants we have funded in the last two years have been uh, either explicitly focused on IADA or um, in 2020, we had a, two priorities, one that was focused on IADA planning and IADA implementation. And then in 2022, we did not, but uh, several states came in asking for funding for implementing their IADA that scored very well and received funding. Um, but there were also other states that submitted things that you know, are very in, innovative in design and asked for funding and the department, they scored highly in the department awarded funds for those. So uh, you can see a list here on this slide, but there's also a link where you could read the abstracts if you're interested in seeing what some of your, your colleague states are, are doing with their CGSA funds, if that helps for any ideas for, for things that you're, you're thinking about or would like to pursue. Um, we do have funding this year for CGSA that we um, will be awarding by next September at the latest. And we will have more information in the, in the near future on um, priorities and deadlines for applying for CGSA in, in 2024. 
All right, I think this is my last slide. Um, I think why we, we have, have you as a, a captive audience, if you will, we wanted to take a chance, uh, a minute to um, plug that we are always looking for peer reviewers. We are um, sometimes receive comments that our, our peers don't understand innovative assessments or um, you know, don't appreciate something different or out of the ordinary. And to the secretary's point, you know, we are very interested in states that are, are looking to push boundaries and are looking to find new ways of um, capturing student knowledge and abilities. And we want peers that can review that documentation and think about uh, you know, how that fits in with making sure it still meets the bar for technical quality as established by um, AERA and NCME. So if you, uh, in your state, if your assessment team is interested, if you're members of your technical advisory committee, or if you know of other outside partners or experts who you think would be good peers, uh, please nominate them or nominate yourselves. We are always looking for new, new, new people to serve as peers. Uh, there's a link here on this page for filling out a form. It's, it's a pretty simple form um, along with providing a resume and that usually is enough to uh, get you on our list of peers, possible peers for a future peer review or for CGSA or IADA. So I, I want to put a plug in for that while I have you. And I think that's my last slide. So we've got a couple questions. Um, the first question about IADA, can IADA funds be used to create assessments that don't supplement or replace summative assessments, but are additional optional assessments. Um, states, uh, this is maybe a good point to reiterate that IADA doesn't explicitly have funds tied to it, um, but under CGSA and under your existing state assessment grants that you receive each year, you can use those funds to design balanced assessments that focus not just on summative assessments, but also that use that help to administer um, interim formative or diagnostic assessments. I think that is, is something that's definitely available for you. Um, and if you wanted to put together an IADA proposal that um, was a balanced assessment that combined summative assessments with other classroom-based assessments or interim or diagnostic or formative tools, uh, that is definitely something you could propose as part of an IADA application. Uh, I, I think that would certainly be something available to you. Uh, the second question, what is the CGSA timeline um, and whether it aligns with IADA timeline? Um, unfortunately, I, I can't provide information about the CGSA timeline. We are working to get out information as quickly as we can. Uh, we will make awards before the end of September. Uh, the first IADA um, application window will be in May, and the intent would be for them to um, be implementing IADA in the 24-25 school year. So if you line those things up, uh, we will be awarding CGSA before or at the start of the 24-25 school year, and we will be making decisions on IAD applications that come in May in summer of um, 2024. And the third question is, um, could the same IAD application be used for CGSA? Do they include the same requirements? Um, the IAD application provides a lot, there's a lot more detail that's required by the statute. Uh, so I, I don't know that you could submit one that would serve both purposes. So there's kind of different questions we ask in a discretionary grant competition as a, compared to the IAD application. But I think the information you provide for IADA would be um, very helpful to use in a CGSA application. Don, is there anything you might wanna add here that would be good advice on this question? Yeah, I, I was going to say something along the lines of what you just said, Patrick. I, I think certainly uh, an IADA application would complement uh, 
a CGSA application and a, a successful CGSA narrative, project narrative, would certainly help populate an IADA application. But in fact, they, they do just have some unique requirements. And so they're not really a combined, they're not a combined application. You'd have to use similar information for each purpose um, would be the way I would describe it. So the next question is, who do we submit IAD requests to enter the planning status to, as well as the application to? Um, I would encourage you to submit the planning status application to our acting secretary, Adam Schott, uh, and also to copy the assessment team mailbox, which is efca.assessment at ed.gov, um, which we are we are happy to, to share with folks to make sure you have that. but. I think um, submitting it to, to Adam's attention will make sure that we we get a response to it as, as quickly as we can. Uh, I'm happy to take the question relative to Montana. I, I think Montana was a, a really unique case based on uh, their utilization of an assessment that was funded by CGSA, their their specific timeline, some of their state goals. Um, so I think what we are trying to do through IADA is allow for additional flexibility through the existing authority for states that want to take us up on that. Montana was also asking for flexibility in other areas relative to reporting and accountability uh, that we would not be able to address through IADA. Just a, a note too that the IADA provides a five-year timeline to transition your assessment system and the Montana field test waiver was only for one year. I know we've got a few minutes left. If there's any, any last questions people wanna raise, uh, and I, in the answer question, Don added the, um, our email address for the assessment team. So if you have other questions you want to share, uh, it's helpful. You can feel free to send them to that email address, and we're, we're happy to answer them and give you um, any particular unique questions you might have for your state. But if you've got more questions you want to answer, you want to answer it on this webinar, we'll, we'll give you a few more minutes. And while we're waiting for any of those, I just want to acknowledge the tremendous work of Brenda and Patrick and Don around um, around this guidance. This is the most significant guidance in the assessment space since at least 2016 by the department. Uh, demonstrates the secretary's commitment to working with states that want to try something new, um, but just very, very excellent and sustained work by the assessment team here, while also managing peer reviews, additional technical assistance to states. So just want to credit all of their work to make this happen. The assessment conference uh, that occurred at the end of September, this webinar, again, all part of the secretary's commitment that we have a steady drumbeat in this space. Thanks, Adam. I, I was also going to flag for states, if you have specific questions in terms of like your, you want to test out a new idea, our team is available and willing to sort of um, offline with you as well. We will drop in our... Um, OESC at ed.gov email in the chat um, for those of you who kind of uh, maybe want to think through a couple of ideas or, or process or next steps. If there are if there are no other questions, we will give everybody back two minutes on their Friday afternoon. Um, and just would reiterate Brenda's invitation that there are lots of ways to get in touch, formally and informally, and want to thank everyone for uh, making time for this conversation this afternoon. Just looking one last time. All right, everybody. Thank you so much. Have a great holiday.